audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. Our series is entitled, Welcome Holy Spirit, Understanding the Book of Acts, a verse-by-verse audio commentary, part of the larger Understanding the Bible series. And friends, the book of Acts is the story of the birth and growth of the Christian church. It is a most remarkable narrative, because the church was birthed and grown in the natural by the most unlikely vessels. It was basically started by 11 down-to-earth, unsophisticated, Galilean fishermen. Oh yes, there were the faithful women, of course, and they were, in many cases, the backbone. But just left to the faithful women and the 11 surviving apostles of Jesus, how far do you think the Christian church could have gone? Not far at all. They didn't have the money. They didn't have the connections. They didn't have the natural clout or pull. They didn't have any of the normal ingredients in order to get ahead. But the one thing they did have, in fact, several things they had. They had the word of God. They had the lordship of Jesus. And they had the empowerment of the person and work of the Holy Spirit. Our series, I've chosen the title, Welcome Holy Spirit. There are other titles we could have used, like the birth of the church, but unless you welcome the Holy Spirit, well, friends, you're not going to get a church, full stop. He is fundamental. And what we began to learn, and I'll enhance this, the Holy Spirit is not a thing, an it, an inanimate object. He's not an impersonal force or wind. The Holy Spirit is is a person, a glorious, divine person, a person who has feelings, has actions, has reactions. He has all the ingredients of personhood. The only thing is he doesn't have a body the way humans have a body. But he is a person and a distinct person from Jesus Christ, Son of God, or from God the Father. These three make up what we call the Godhead. And throughout both Old and New Testament, there is either by implication, regular implication, I might add, as well as divine revelation, that there's more than one personality in the Godhead, but there's only one God. He is a compound unity rather than a solitary unity. It's interesting that in Israel's national creed, Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, The Lord is one. There is actually, ironically, more than one word in the Hebrew for the word one. You would think there's only one word for one. No, there's actually at least two words for the word one in Hebrew. One is yachid, which is basically solitary, oneness, the one and only. And there's echad, yachid and echad. Echad means compound unity, like one family. Now, there are many members, perhaps, in the family, but there's still only one family. Whether it's a family of five or a family of ten, it's still one family. Echad. Or you can use it for one nation. Echad. So you can have a big nation, many people, or a small nation, many people, but it's still one nation. The Lord our God is Echad. Compound unity. And while More than once, several times in the Old Testament, it implies the possibility of multiple personalities in the Godhead. Only thing the New Testament does, it limits those persons to three. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But it's not three God, it's one God. That's why in the baptismal formula of Jesus found in Matthew 28, 19, we are told to baptize in the name, singular, the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So, in the book of Acts, we will see what we call the birth and the growth of the church. And I like the phrase that was used by one author, I think it's Michael Green, and he wrote a brilliant commentary on the book of Acts. I think it's called 30 Years (laughs) That Changed the World, something of that effect. But he said something that I still remember, that the church people, the Christians, 
in the book of Acts. There's something to the fact that they were always joyful, they were fearless, and they were always in trouble. Joyful, fearless, but always in trouble. There is truth to that perception, and there's a whole lot of things we're going to see. But welcome to the book of Acts as you welcome the Holy Spirit. I want to read to you again from the book of Acts. In this case, it'll be the first two verses, Acts chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. I read them last time, but I feel to read them again as we have an introduction to this most important book of the Bible. And it reads, Acts chapter 1, verse 1, The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. So, what this author, Luke, is saying, he's addressing this epistle of Acts, or this actually book of Acts, not an epistle, it's a book, the book of Acts, to Theophilus, the same person that he addressed the Gospel of Luke, because he's the author of both, the Gospel of Luke and Acts. And he refers to the Gospel of Luke here as the former treatise. So in his former treatise, he has written what Jesus began both to do and to teach. So the Gospel of Luke is about the life and ministry of Jesus, with, of course, an evangelistic emphasis. This is why, because Luke is a historian and he talks about all that Jesus began to do and teach, that the Gospel of Luke is very, very long. Much longer, say, than the Gospel of Mark that precedes it. But even in the Gospel of Luke, he doesn't talk about everything. It's impossible. If he talked about everything, the Gospel of Luke would be bigger than this planet where we dwell. Because Jesus did a lot and continues to do a lot even until now. But it's interesting In the former treatise, he wrote about what Jesus did and taught, and then he wrote all the way up until his ascension. And at his ascension, of course, he's giving commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. So he talks about basically the fact that really the book of Acts is the proper sequel to the Gospel of Luke. He doesn't put it in those terms, but that's pretty much what it is. He says what he tried to accomplish in the first book, and then... Without saying, now I'm going to write a second book, he just writes the second book, and away you go. You almost wonder if he uh, planned to write this book of Acts or planned to write it as lengthy as he planned. But then remember, Luke was baptized, filled, and led and controlled by the Holy Spirit. It really was a partnership, and the Holy Spirit is clearly the senior partner in inspiring all Scripture, and especially here in the book of Acts. What I want to do now, let's just change tack. Let's have the second part of our introduction, our introduction to the book of Acts. And we learn, first of all, that the book of Acts is called, in the Greek, which is the language that was first written in, Koine Greek, it is called praxius. Praxius, and praxius means acts or actions or in this case, Acts of the Apostles. But, you know, when we call it Acts of the Apostles, it really is only focusing on two main apostles, perhaps even three. In the book of Acts, it focuses on the Acts of the Apostle Peter in the beginning of the book, and then, say, around chapter 8, it focuses on another apostle, namely Philip, who went to Samaria and saw a great revival there. And then, For pretty much the rest of the book, chapter 13 to chapter 28, it focuses on the Apostle Paul himself. And, I mean, he gets a lot of coverage. What I think this is interesting is, of course, in chapter 1, they filled the vacancy that was left by the betrayal and death of Judas Iscariot, the vacancy of the twelfth apostle, and they filled it with a man called Matthias. Now, to be honest, I have some pretty strong feelings about this appointment of Matthias, but I'll save it for when we get to that section of the book of Acts. But remember that even though Matthias was chosen in Acts 1, the emphasis is not on him, and it's not even on the other, you know, say we say 10 apostles, or 11, except for Peter, the emphasis is is on Peter, one of the twelve, Philip, who's not one of the twelve, and 
of course, Paul, who also is not one of the twelve. It appears that the circle of apostles has grown with the birth of the church. Because after all, even though these 11 surviving apostles were baptized and empowered by the Holy Spirit, there's no way they by themselves are going to preach the gospel into all the world. It would be a growing team effort. So then, who is the author of Acts? Well, we've already said it is Luke. Now, he doesn't actually use his name here, but the fact he uses Theophilus' name is a giveaway. And he's universally considered to be the author. It is probable that this very gifted man, who appears to be an eyewitness to many of the events that he writes of in Acts. How do we know he's an eyewitness? Because he talks about the pronoun, first person pronoun, plural. We did this, we did that, we did the other. It's like he was actually a companion of Paul without saying as much. And then he continues to use his amazing investigative skills to provide details of the birth and growth of the church that we find nowhere else in Scripture. When did he write this book? Possibly around the sixth decade of the first century, because it ends in Rome. And basically, Paul is under house arrest in Rome as the book ends, and he's entertaining people and evangelizing. And we don't actually hear the story of what happens if and when he met with Caesar, which is the reason he's in Rome in the first place. We believe the book of Acts basically serves as a bridge between the four Gospels and the epistles. And really, it shows how the church had gone from being a purely Jewish affair, because remember, friends, the Savior, the apostles, were all Jewish. The early church was all Jewish and possibly stayed all Jewish for the first decade of its existence. There possibly wasn't even a Samaritan in the midst of the Christian church for those first few years. But as the church grows, it's encompassing Samaritans. And Jesus implied this would be the case when they went to all Judea and Samaria, but it also will include a growing list of Gentiles that they would go to the ends of the earth. So what is the theme of the book of Acts? The theme is the birth and growth of the church by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's a wonderful thing. The birth and growth of the church by the power of the Holy Spirit. What are some key verses? Well, I want to give you Acts 1 verse 8 and Acts 2 Acts 1 verse 8, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. All right, that's one way to summarize the book of Acts. The second way to summarize it is here in verse 42, or shall we say chapter 2, verse 42 to 47. Acts 2, verses 42 to 47, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common. And they sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. What a wonderful, wonderful passage. It's Acts 2 verses 42 to 47. This is really a good summary of the birth and growth of the church. That's what key verses are anyway. Those verses summarize what the whole book is about. So then we also learn about the person of Christ. What is the portrait of Christ found in the book of Acts? Well, the portrait of Christ is basically the book of Acts shows him to be Lord, which is he's the master of the universe. All authority is given to him on heaven and earth. He is Lord, but he's also called Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, the son of David, who will rule from David's throne in Jerusalem over the whole earth. We learn of him as the resurrected, ascended Savior, the Lord, the Christ. And it's interesting 
that there are inter- phrases used about Christ in the book of Acts. For example, Acts 3, verse 14, he's called the Holy One and just. In Acts 3, verse 15, he's called the Prince of Life. In Acts 4, verse 27, he's called thy holy child Jesus. Acts 5, 31, he's called a prince and a savior. In Acts 10, 36, he's called Lord of all. Acts 13, verse 47, he's called a light to the Gentiles. So there are some interesting titles and phrases used about Jesus Christ in the book of Acts. And of course, as we continue to learn the New Testament, and especially the book of Revelation, you will see other titles, amazing titles and amazing descriptions. And the reason we focus on this is the more we understand the portraits of Christ, the titles, the descriptions, the more we understand Christ. He is not just this wonderful, miracle-working man from Nazareth in Galilee who relocated to Capernaum and ministered to Jew and Gentile alike. He is both Lord and Christ. If we can't remember anything else about his description in Acts, let's remember that. God has made him Lord and Christ. So in the Gospels, Jesus is crucified and risen. In Acts, he is ascended and he is the exalted Savior and Lord. So we see, of course, in the Gospels, Christ teaching. But in Acts, we see the results of his teaching at work. And it uses the word witness, perhaps at least two dozen times or more. And Acts talks about not just the Christian witness, but it tells us, like, in a sense, a guidebook on Christian mission. And, of course, Acts anticipates the second coming of Jesus, which we know will be local, physical, personal, and visible. So personal, visible, local, and physical. So much more we can learn, and we will begin and continue to learn this in our next lesson. taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.